Good afternoon. We're quickly moving into the end of 2023. My name is Barbara Velasquez, and I'd like to thank everyone who's dedicated their time and interest in participating in international intercultural education programs this year. Today, we look forward to another discussion of a book that may enlighten or confirm your experiences with culture, diversity across the world, and thoughts on how you can enhance your personal and professional interactions with others. If you decide you would like to see this program again, our discussion leader has generously allowed us to record and offer on-demand viewing in the future. Just check out mccneb.edu slash book series where links to the recordings are held. And you'll also be able to explore a series of recordings from Metropolitan Community College on the college's YouTube page. So today it is my honor to introduce Nashad Mustafa, who was born in India of Bengali parents. He grew up in Africa and the Middle East. He studied in the United States of America, securing his first degree from Indiana University in Fort Wayne. While he was pursuing a second degree at Bellevue University, we are proud to state that he took classes at Metropolitan Community College. So Nashad is familiar with us, even though he's quite some uh, miles away from us and he'll tell us about that today. Nashad worked as an engineer for three years in Micron in Idaho. He immigrated to Canada and trained to be a teacher and he developed himself into what is known as an international teacher has, and has now taught in Canada, the USA, Colombia, Egypt, China, and Uzbekistan. And of course, currently, as you've noted um, on the advertisements, he is in Canada, in Alberta, and he is at the Cato Lake School. And I may have mispronounced that title, but he will he will tell us a little bit about that experience and maybe a little bit of, about what it means to be an international teacher. So please welcome. Nashad Mustafa. Thank you, Barbara. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I would like to add that uh, one of the reasons that I decided to do this book is because uh, the background of the writer, Umar, is uh, very similar to mine. Both of us are from Indian subcontinent, from a Muslim uh, background. And we have actually some almost very similar experiences. He was in Canada during 9-11 and faced some backlash. I was in USA during 9-11. We faced a similar kind of backlash. And he seems to have interest in history, um, languages, uh, political science, sociology. I have similar uh, interests as well. And the biggest similarity is, of course, in context of the book, that we are both brown boys. So, so that uh, gives me a better insight, probably, into this book than uh, maybe a person who does not have that uh, background might have. So the way we are going to uh, do this uh, is we are going to discuss each slide and then we are going to see if you have any question. Again, the name of the writer of this book is Omer Aziz, and my name is Naushad Mustafa. And he is actually from Pakistan. And I am half Bengali, half Indian. So I am also from the Indian uh, subcontinent. Omer Aziz is a second generation Muslim immigrant from a humble background and eventually he makes it big in North America. That is the theme of this book. And the word make it big in North America basically means to us who are immigrants, the, uh, you know, eventually ends up with a quote unquote white collar job. That's what it uh, makes 
uh, means when you say make it big in North America. And of course, I am another brown boy who has also ended up being a teacher in North America, though I was an engineer before in USA. I didn't like it too much. And I am going to analyze and try to discuss some insights into this book. And I hope you all will have read this book already and you can join me in discussion when we are going through the slides and you can ask me any question or even some comment. Okay, so Umar was born in Canada. Now, that means that he's a second generation Canadian. His parents already got Canadian citizenship before he was born. Uh, that is not my background. I am a first generation Canadian. I had to get my own immigration. So that makes a little bit of a difference. He has a Muslim Pakistani background. I have mainly a Bengali Indian background. His parents were not very educated and relatively poor. Now, if you have read that book, you can see that his father basically came here in some kind of immigrant visa, tried to finish some kind of college and ended up being a, uh, what you call a parking ticket assistant or something like that, which is okay, but uh, he was never very uh, wealthy with that kind of job. And uh, Umar grew up in poor immigrant neighborhood and I have been to his neighborhood. Uh, it is uh, what you call lower middle class a neighborhood with a lot of foreigners who are first or second generation um, Canadians. Uh, there was a lot of gang violence and bullying in his school. His home was trying to make him a good Pakistani. So that is one of the problem uh, that we always have. Our parents who are here often don't understand the outside is very different and they insist that we do the same things as our home country, which is not always feasible. So at home, he was trying to be a good Pakistani, but in school, which was a kind of a rap culture, gang culture, he tried to fit in. And he also had to go to mosque because his parents forced him to. They are the extreme <coughs> conservative Muslim culture was also not to his liking. So at the end of the day, he felt that he did not fit anywhere. So that is quite a common feeling for these type of kids whose parents are very insistent on them uh, preserving their culture, but they have to have a life outside, work outside. So that is not unusual. Any question, any of you faced similar things growing up here in USA? Nashad, I would like to um, ask you um, something that I found interesting was, so mother makes him go to the mosque. Yes. The one that believes that should happen. Um, his father, there were, they had differences about that, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, but the thing that was a little surprising to me was it seemed like the culture inside the mosque was a little violent for him also among the boys that were mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that was surprising to me. Okay, there are two reasons uh, that the mosques that are in North America are funded by a certain sect of Islam called Wahhabi Salafi. And those are funded by, used to be funded by Saudi Arabia. That kind of Islam is a little bit of different from the kind of Islam that he must have been following in his family in Southeast Asia, which is a little milder. So that was one of the reasons that when the teachers used to hit him and all that, it was uncomfortable because uh, probably his home was a little milder and he's even in his country or his background was if a milder form of Islam. So even I growing up faced it that some mosques has a, a different type of Islam. As far as the boys being violent in mosque, I think these are all the gang boys that were forced to say, uh, come to mosque in the evening 
by their parents. So uh, they basically brought in their gang culture in the mosque, which was uh, not very well monitored uh, by the adults to see uh, what is going on after the Quran reading and other things, which is again quite common. Thank you. We do have a comment from Abdul who says, I relate very much as a Muslim second generation American. Yes, that is true. And if you look at some of the people who have gone to the wrong end and became violent and all this, some of them were born in London, America, uh, Canada, and their parents are perfectly all right, regular moderate Muslims, but they went to some mosque and got radicalized by some preacher and the parents had no idea. This is quite common. I appreciate that. Thank you. So he was not a good student in school and main reasons for that was psychological from what I understand by reading the book. He thought that his life was useless. There was no hope. He could not understand what is right, what is wrong, who he should follow. So although he was basically bright, he did not do well in school initially. And he had a real complex about his brown color, which again, uh, is uh, it is not no more usual. It used to be more usual probably 50 years ago when there are less immigrants. But nowadays there are so many brown, yellow, all sorts of colors. Uh, skin color is no longer an issue anymore. But anyway, he faced it and he had a problem with his color and he used to try to hide it. And also he had a problem with the dresses that his mother used to wear when they used to pick her up in school and everything else. So uh, he, for whatever reason, uh, had a inferiority complex, which again, as a, as a foreigner, I did not face it that way. Uh, I never, you know, had any problem with my brown skin. I always thought it was quite nice and all that. So even the joke is that we have anti-cancer in our skin, whites don't. So all that kind of things we used to joke about. So in his case, it seems the complex for being a brown and a foreigner and a Pakistani was a little too much uh, from what I have seen. And then comes Obama and he listens to a speech by Obama and that inspires him. I think the logic is, if a black man can be the president of USA, why can't I be at least something, you know, something more reasonable, something more, uh, uh, more successful than I am? I think that was the logic uh, behind him. And so he has started becoming a serious student after that. So once that psychological barrier that I am good for nothing was removed by Obama, he decided to concentrate on his studies and he very quickly became one of the top students in the class. But because he was from a poor background and his parents were not educated, he probably uh, became a little too ambitious and tried to get a scholarship in some of the most leading universities in America. And initially he got rejected, which is not surprising because his school was not some very high class school in uh, Toronto or, or you know some suburb of Toronto. And so most probably he um, was aiming a little higher than at that time. So he got accepted in Queens University. And during also that time, his relatives who were also not very educated. Some of them were taxi drivers. Some of them were um, cleaners. They have all migrated from Pakistan in last 20 years or so. And so the education was not a part of the main um, practice of the family. So they were all skeptical about him. And in South Asian culture, there is a lot of jealousy. If you're children are doing well, your brother's brother gets jealous, so on and so forth. So there was some kind of, you know, people tried to pull him down a little. And also at that time, he broke up with his uh, Jamaican girlfriend, I believe. And uh, he left for Queen. So basically, from his book, I could see that he was trying to close this chapter of his life. 
and start a new chapter when he went to Queens. Any question so far? I would like to sh share something that Nasha just said. Um, there was a part where I think he maybe leaked some of his plans to family and they started to criticize him, just where you're saying that sometimes people don't support you. And I, I just love the way that the author writes, and I strongly encourage people if they haven't read this book yet, but on page 116, parents avoided telling, his parents started to avoid telling the family and friends about things that their kids wanted to do because they didn't want to hear the, the negativity. And something that he, he stated was, if there was one thing brown people were good at, my father once said, it was bringing each other down. That made me really sad, you know, to read that. But I think that um, within communities, people probably can relate to that outside of the Pakistani culture also. Yes, that is true. And uh, sometimes uh, it is jealousy. And sometimes it is something like in our culture, Indian culture or Pakistani culture, uh, they are not sure if somebody wants to study philosophy, history, political science, what kind of use this type of subjects will have in real life. So they don't know if these subjects can be used for a good job. So they are very skeptical about these subjects. And that is why I personally, although I have always been interested in these subjects, my training is in engineering and then in education because by studying those subjects, number one, I could not apply for any kind of immigration related jobs or jobs that will give me immigration, not even immigration to Canada. So although I always liked these subjects, I never formally trained in them. It was more of a hobby. So these are the two factors. And because he was second generation, he already had his citizenship. He could uh, train in these subjects and still get a job. But if he was first generation, where his immigration was not still done, uh, this type of, if you have this type of degrees from USA, uh, you may not get any job in USA. So that's something people who were born and brought up in USA may not know. That's unfortunate. That's really true. good point. Really good point. And I think um, here we see so many international students studying nursing, for example. Yes. I always say every day I meet somebody else who's studying nursing. Isn't that great? There's going to be a lot of people to take care of us. <laughs> <laughs> and many of them, once they get their immigration somehow, they will leave nursing and go to some other field. Mm -hmm. So it is just we are forced to do these subjects. Okay. So when he went to Queens, his inferiority complex continued with him because Queens had a lot of white rich kids maybe driving nice cars and spending money and uh, maybe uh, wearing fancy dresses, which he did not have. He did have another girlfriend in Queens who was a Sikh Indian girl, but that did not last long. And again, if you are not familiar with the Indian subcontinent, Sikhs and Muslims have been uh, ancient enemies. So, <laughs> If a Sikh parents hear you're dating a Muslim boy, they might be very angry and vice versa. So although they are both brown probably, and they had similar culture because of their historical enmity between Sikhs and Muslims in Indian subcontinent, uh, uh, unless they were uh, you know, totally out of that culture and decided to make a new home here, if they had any contact with their parents, it would not be a, a good match from the family uh, side. So he didn't mention that, but I know um, from Indian history and also present culture that Sikhs and Muslims, they have a real antagonism uh, for each other. Any question? It seemed like he, because of his interest in history and philosophy, et cetera, he found it hard to believe that those divisions occurred because he'd say we basically are the same people yes, right? yes he wasn't part of 
of he, he couldn't accept part of the society that would say that because she seemed to be very afraid of her family. Yes. And he was like, big deal, right? <laughs> right. And also, I think part of it is sometimes I see some denial, uh, some uh, some part of history that might not be very pleasant uh, or according to his, you know, um, according to his basically uh, model of how the world should be, he tries to uh, deny it, which we'll see more in Paris in our next slide. So let's go to the next slide. Well, before we do that, or you can move yes. on, but there is a comment. Why can't we all just get along? Well, I think there has been many books written on that, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> and many more to be written, right? Written, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so now this is a very interesting part of his life. And although he does not say anything about many things, but because I am a brown boy and I have uh, lived his part of his life, I know that a lot of things he is not saying. So I will try to uh, go into a little more depth that the book has gone. So he managed to get one semester, uh, some kind of scholarship in Paris. I don't know if it was complete a scholarship or part, partly, I think, or maybe funded by his father. So he went there with a lot of high hopes, but his high hopes were dashed. Paris was too expensive and his accommodation was bad. Besides the economic disparity between immigrants and average French had a negative impression on him. So if you read his book when he is in Paris, it sounds very sad, almost like he woke up uh, like his dream was shattered in Paris. I will tell you what I think happened. Because Indian subcontinent was ruled by British for 200 years, we tend to put all the blame on the British people. And we think that compared to British people, the French are very nice. They had this egalitarian revolution. They are all equal. They are all highly cultured. They are all very fancy. Everybody is happy in Paris. Everybody is happy in France. This is the type of probably, and he read some French philosophers also during his uh, time in Queens. So he was having some kind of uh, dream vision of Paris. And also in movies, you see Paris is a city of romance, La Paris, et cetera, et cetera. So when he went to the real Paris, and his first experience was the poor Muslim areas of Paris, which were in suburb where there was a lot of crime. The French people tried to avoid these North American African Muslims because there were many criminals there. They were poor. And the poverty in Paris was much more than anything he has seen in Canada. Uh, Canada, the poverty is not obvious. But in Paris, the poverty is obvious. There are literally ghettos, people are begging. I have been to Paris as a kid, so I know how Paris is. And at that time, Paris was much better. Now I hear it is even worse. So Paris was not the Paris of his dream. So that really kind of uh, made him very confused because he had this ideal idealization of the French and Paris. And that in turn caused depression. And it looks like from his description that it was almost clinical depression in Paris. And uh, there might be two, three reasons. One is he does mention passingly some ancestors of his who might have had some depression. One. So it might be partly um, this thing, uh, biochemical, genetically. And usually uh, doctors will tell you that most of the psychiatric problems occur between age of 12 and 30 and then after 50. So he was the right age to be afflicted with certain kind of uh, not very severe, but severe enough so that he could not finish his um, studies in Paris. And I have some similarities. I was afflicted with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder 
on my final year in my Indiana University and my results were not as good as they would be if I was not afflicted. And it took me a couple of years to realize it and get the right medication and things like that. So this is not at all unusual, especially if you are a foreign student somewhere and you are under a lot of pressure, uh, you may be afflicted with uh, different types of disorder during this time. So any question? I'm just gonna add, um, I think for anybody who works with people, reading this book has great value because his way of describing how he felt uh -huh. and the consequences is done so well that I think it can help you understand depression if it's never happened to you. Mm -hmm. And um, that that in itself, I don't, I've never seen it written this way, but I thought it was very um, instructive, very- Yes. Related. And I think he was surprised that he was so enthusiastic about his studies, but his enthusiasm was all gone in Paris. He didn't like to get out of his bed. And then he talks about some uh, people from Paris that finally uh, became friendly with him. I think an older gentleman helped him out, took him to some gatherings. But even in those gatherings, he suffered from complex, maybe his dress or shirt was not nice enough. Uh, he was brown and all those kind of things. So uh, the complexity of his life, his background, and maybe some biochemical genetic process, all of them made him basically uh, uh, drop that semester in Paris, which is very unusual for him. We do have a comment that's come through. Um... Mm -hmm. Our Native American culture also criticizes people who leave the reservations to become educated and feel they are becoming better than the ones who they are leaving, the ones they are leaving. Recently, more of our Native Americans are becoming and returning to their people. Is, is this happening with his people or are they only coming back to work with people in the US? So I think that the question is, would he get educated and go back to Pakistan, although he was born in Canada? Canada. Now, this is a complicated question because Native Americans, when they go back to their people, they're still in America or Canada. So it's the same economic system, same amount of money. The main problem in Pakistan and India is the salary. Even if he wants to go back to Pakistan and India, his salary will be so low that he, unless he's already very rich, he will not be able to do anything with his salary. So even if we want to go back, like I would love to go back to India and work for some time, but the salary will be so low that uh, it will, I will not be basically uh, living hand to mouth. So that is the main reason that we don't go back. Otherwise, it is not that India or Pakistan, we have anything against or we don't love to live there. It is because of the economic situation. It's a little different from the Native American scenario where there is a, a real uh, you know, thing of that, you know, us and them, that we are the original, original owners of this land and it was taken from us and et cetera, et cetera. Those kind of feeling that Native Americans have. Uh, but uh, for us immigrants, our main reason is uh, economic and also law and order situation maybe a little bit. Nasha, did you want to say, you shared with me something in, in our previous conversation about the number of students that you're supposed to have in your classes in the location of Canada where you are. And I mean, it, it can kind of relate to this comment. Yes, yes. Uh, I am teaching uh, right now in a native Canadian school and they give us very good facilities and also i like, like a little bit of hunting and nature and other things that's why i'm here but uh, the students don't want to come to class so out of 23 will come or four will come maximum because they feel that uh, education is not important now i don't know where their their community is trying very hard canadian government is giving their education a lot of money but the enthusiasm for education is not there. And some people blame it to the, 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 the school system, residential school system. Uh, and some blame it 
to addiction. Uh, probably it's a mixture of all of those things. There is another comment since you mentioned salary. Is salary more important than working with your people? You have to survive, right? <laughs> if you cannot pay the rent with your salary, then there is a problem. <laughs> Most of the salaries in India, unless you have a parent's house or your own house, to even your whole salary will go in rent. So what do you do? <laughs> so it is a more problem. It is not about having a little less money or little more money. It is about having literally not enough money to survive. So I will go to the next slide now. London. So, so after that, he, I believe, gets a scholarship to London. And this is a full scholarship from what I understand. His parents who are semi-educated did not understand the difference between going to Paris without much scholarship and a full scholarship in London. They kind of thought maybe in London, he will have the same problem. He will not finish it, come back and things like that. And because probably we grow up with a little bit of anti-British sentiment because we are colony of Britain, he did not have a good idea about London before he went there. But once he went there, he found out that both his financial and social situation was much better than it was in France. That is first thing. And second thing, I think, although he doesn't say it directly, we often have this idea that these British are very uh, class oriented. They are very proud. They don't want to mix with anybody. Uh, he did not find it that way in his college, from what I can see. Uh, that uh, they were friendly enough. There was nothing worse than France. And in France, his financial situation was bad. But here, his financial situation was good. And he also enjoyed studies there. He doesn't talk much about depression in London. But from what I know about depression, if it was clinical, probably it never left him. But the severity of depression was such that he could still function uh, in that depression. And uh, he met some famous people, including Bill Charles and another person who was some kind of famous government spy master, a retired spy master or something from the British intelligence and things like that. He had some fun there, it looks like. And but the inferiority complex that he always had because his parents are not educated and he's brown skin, that kind of uh, never left him totally. He still tried to hide the fact that he was from Pakistan and he was brown and uh, his economic situation was not as good as his peers. So he still tried to hide that from his acquaintances. But in general, uh, his experience in London was much better and he seemed to have finished the studies there successfully. Any question, comments about London, Paris comparison or anything like that? So though Paris was a disappointment, London was, I think, better than he expected. That's how I can put it from his uh, language. Yeah, we really appreciate your giving us more background information that helps to explain, you know, where things maybe he didn't understand himself. Himself, right? right. Subconscious. Because he was born in Canada. His situation was different than somebody would have grown up in Pakistan. But he had the Pakistani influence that maybe it was so mixed in him. He didn't mixed in. know how to articulate that. Living here in Tennessee, I see many people from higher class Indian and Pakistani backgrounds. Why is that? Good question. Very good question. There are three types of immigrants in USA or in Canada. One is those who made it big. They went to some medical college. They became a doctor. They became some famous or very skilled engineer. They made a lot of money and they did well. So that is one class. The other class is that either could not complete their studies or were not good in studies. They went out of uh, college and they had odd jobs. Some of them are illegal. Most of you know that there are about, what, uh, 20 
15 to 20 million illegals in USA, I think, at any time. I might be wrong, but uh, that's what I hear. So uh, that kind of thing. And also there are the third one who come here as a refugee status immigrant and they get some kind of low job because their English is not good and they don't have any skills that these countries will accept. And then they build up from there. So he came from the third category. His parents got immigration because of Justin Trudeau's father. He had some kind of program where he brought a lot of Pakistani workers to do work. And his father tried to go to college, but did not really do well there and became a ticket, um, some kind of you know ticketing person with the government of Toronto or something like that. So he was son of the third category of immigrants, if that answers your question. I was going to say, I think we do hear more about the upper class. And this book shows that difference, definitely. Yes, yes. I think he met some uh, parents from uh, Pakistani parents from some other student who were doctors or something. And he was really, really shaky to introduce his parents with them because he felt that just by looking the way his father walks, talks, those people understand that this person from a lower strata. And this strata is much more pronounced in Indian subcontinent than in North America. So, for example, if a person is a driver, he will not come and sit in front of you. He'll come and stand in front of you. That kind of thing, which is very unfortunate, but that's how it works. Then there is the servant class, the worker class. So, although those things are not applicable in Canada, but the culture kind of brings it here. And he was aware of that. So. Yeah, the um, the scene that he described, that was also, I'd forgotten it, but it was also very, I guess, heart-wrenching because it was a graduation celebration. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, you want to believe that everybody who graduates is going to be honored, right? And, right. And maybe, maybe his father felt like his graduation had maybe changed his status some because... I think he tried to outreach to the other gentleman. Yes. And the man couldn't even yes, speak yes. a word to him. He like the fact that a lower class person was trying to talk to him, you felt how thick that tension was when you read about it. And like you said, it seemed like it really stayed with Omer for a long time. And I think he describes where his father was talking mainly and that man was mainly listening very politely and it almost looked like that he was just tolerating his father kind of uh, and uh, coming from indian subcontinent we understand it by probably more more you know than probably people who who never been to those car, car areas because the class difference is very very sad and very very strong okay so any other question comment my question was that I believe that our society and many societies do not understand mental health. And uh, and that's what happens in part. And culturally, I, my background is Cuban descent. And my family came over, my grandmother came over turn of the century to Tampa, Florida. And, uh, and so what I realized pretty early on is that my home setting was very different from like when I started school, because we moved to New York City when I was three years old. And so I have felt that duality. And even years later, you know, like I've gone on to get an education and all that stuff. And what I felt was that I was abandoning my family if I went on to do these other things. And, uh, and so uh, it, it really tears you up in a way if you don't learn to manage it. Uh, with your parents, you know, because you don't want to tell tell your family, well, I'm moving up. Like my, I had an uncle who said, because I was very talkative, I my it would be great if I could be at the Woolworth showing uh, samples of things. You know, that was like what he thought was a big thing, and I had my eye on something very different. So, um, you know, I can understand that it even happens worse if you're very brown. I mean, in my family, I was very I'm more fair skin than some of my family, but, uh, but all of those factors impact you. 
And um, I've lived in Ankara, Turkey for two years. And so I was familiar with that culture. And then I went to visit India um, when, uh, as an adult back in 2017. And, you know, so you need to, um, in order to help people make transitions or understand to live with themselves and the values they have, but at the same time, be able to move in the majority culture. That's, that takes a lot of work and understanding and help. And I don't think we have enough of that in our society because we look and we just see whatever the color of the skin is, or if your eyes are different or, you know, and we make assumptions that are not real. So I just think that it's amazing when people do break those barriers uh, because we give them an opportunity so that I, I'm very concerned with what's happening in the world today because there's so much discrimination based on just how a person looks. And we're not giving even children a chance to really develop who they are. Thank you, Martha. We appreciate share. those comments. Yeah. Um, we do have another question. Do you believe the caste system will ever end? Uh, officially, it is banned in India for last 60 years. But uh, caste system actually uh, takes many forms. And uh, sometimes people may not realize that the British themselves have a caste system. If you read the, um, if you read the biographies of the British that came to India, for example, uh, some very famous ones, and you will see that their caste system was not like in India that you cannot eat with a person or you cannot sit next to a person. In India, it was severe among the Hindus. It was not that severe among Muslims or Buddhists. But in Britain, if you were not the son of some kind of uh, royalty, you could not often get a commission in the army as an officer. You could only join as a regular soldier. So the British themselves also have a caste system. So Indian caste system was probably the worst because it was so extreme. But every society I go to, I see there is some un, unsaid or silent or open secret caste system that nobody talks about, but it is there. When I went to Latin America, Colombia, I could see that people who had pure uh, Spanish, who are descendants of pure Spanish, felt they were better than people who are mixed descendant of Indian and Spanish together. They never said it, but you could see that from their body language there. And most of them were economically better uh, than the mestizos or the ones that had mixed background. So that made it worse. So these things are there everywhere. So no, un unofficial caste system will never end from my perspective. But official caste system, we can deregulate it and we can make it illegal and we can improve the situation, but it will always be there for many people. Thank you. We're, we're getting rid, there's a lot of deep stuff in this book, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so we'll move to the next slide then. Now, after he graduated from his studies in Canada and England, he got an offer in Yale Law School, which he tried long time ago, I think. Uh, but at that time he didn't get it now he was his gpo was good enough he had enough degrees and all that so he went to usa with very high hopes as well that this is the world's oldest democracy and all that but he had some personal tragedies at this time his father was uh, diagnosed with cancer and his father was never very close to him although his father loved him very much from what I understand from his reading, that he never had the intellectual capacity or the imagination to understand his rather complicated son. He was a very simple person who used to be, who used to like to boast and who was a little quarrelsome and who was a kind of a fighter, but he was not a very subtle or intellectual man. So he never really understood his complicated son. Although later in life, he began to be impressed by his results and probably his thoughtful uh, character and all that. So once the father was diagnosed with cancer and the father, I think, kept it secret for some time for some family reasons that he didn't want to interrupt some things in the family. He realizes that in spite of all this harshness and uh, often, um, how can I say, uh, uh, often very unimaginative 
uh, or uh, harmful way his father has behaved with him. Uh, his father loved him very much. I think he understands that and loved him, all of them very much. And I think his father became a little softer in his personality from what I can understand that uh, and was from there on always encouraged him to do whatever he wanted to do and did not criticize him that he used to do before. So that was a big change uh, in his personal situation with his uh, father. Any question regarding the father? I don't think we have any questions about the father. Um, we do have continued conversation about, um, you know, discrimination within Native American cultures too. So mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, I think this goes back to the question of caste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, I would like just to point out the kind of father he described uh, is not at all unusual among the ethnic group he belongs to. His father is a Pashtun. He never says it, but I can read between the lines. His father is a Pashtun. I don't know why he doesn't say it. Maybe because a lot of Pashtuns were involved in the jihad of 9-11 and all that. Taliban is from Pashtun, all those kind of things. Maybe that's why he never says it. But his father was a Pashtun, mother maybe was a Pashtun or a Punjabi. I am not 100% sure. So that kind of strict uh, father who thinks beating his son is the right way to bring him up or criticizing him all the time is the right way to bring him up is not at all unusual in the Pashtun culture that the father came from. I don't know if there is any Pashtun here in my audience. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very harsh culture, very tough culture. So that's understandable that his father was like that. It was interesting how he became softer. I like he, that you brought that up. Yes. How he became softer. And for a long time, he has been observing his son without understanding. But later in life, although he did not totally understand his son, he figured enough out to see that his son is something uh, intellectual that probably is beyond him. I think he kind of figured that out at least all these philosophers and all these things he talks about, reads, although I don't think he never fully understood those things, but at least he understood enough to say that this is something good. Okay, then he goes to USA. And again, in USA, he went with a lot of dreams, the land of the free or the land of the brave or something. So, and it is the oldest democracy and all that kind of things. But again, the difference between the poor and the rich in USA, because USA does have some ghettos more than Canada does. So it kind of shocked him. And also some of the crime that he personally witnessed or that happened around him was also a little bit of shocking. And he may have mentioned that the ethnic black or brown communities of USA are economically a little more uh, challenged than the white uh, community. So all of those things uh, kind of put a damper on his, on his enthusiasm for USA. And then he started taking an interest in international affairs, Syria, China, Ukraine, Israel, all these exciting things. He started discussing them with some people who had more experience than him. And I think there was a one person he mentions either in Canada or USA who helped him go deeper in these kind of things. And uh, then uh, he finished whatever he was doing in Yale school and he finished his law. And his probably biggest thing is when he came back, he started working with Canadian foreign minister, Christia Freeland. And uh, she is of course the liberal party. The reason I think he got a job there is because he, belong to Democratic Party in USA and Liberal Party in Canada and Democratic Party in USA are twins. They like each other. So probably there was some connection there that somebody pulled some things and he ended up in Canada's foreign office. So that was a highlight of his career that a person who was the son of a ticket uh, inspector or something uh, has become the, uh, has is working in the foreign office in Canada and he's not even white. So so that was a big highlight of his career. Any questions, comments? It's impressive as you read through the book that 
the names of people that you know that he worked with, worked or with. talked to. Um, very impressive. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Now, this is a very interesting time of his life. Here he gets his dream job. And then when, when he goes to this job, he feels that he is discriminated against, devalued, his advice is often ignored. And at some point, when he tries to give them advice, they kind of make fun of him or ignore him. And he's even taken off some important email lists. And when he tries to give his unique cultural perspective in regards to war in Afghanistan and Middle East, he is ignored. And that really incenses him because he feels with his background, he has a deeper insight into Afghanistan and Middle East than this quote unquote white guys who has never been out of a first world country. So that really, uh, you know, kind of makes him very angry. He feels worthless and depressed. And also at this time, his grandmother who was very close to him, passes away. Here I can see that he has gone into again, a clinical sort of depression. And he resigns from his post, his dream job, and he gets, takes a two year break. So this is very interesting because here he is who got, say, gets a dream job. And within less than a year, I think, he resigns from that position and he basically goes for treatment for depression. So as you can see, the depression never really left him. It was always there. But whenever something triggers it, it becomes so severe that he cannot function properly. That's what it looks like to me. One of the instances that he gives in this is that somebody told him to throw a trash, throw trash out, and that really hurt him. Now, <coughs> playing the devil's advocate, I don't think it has much to do with whether it's brown, white. Whenever you are junior in something like a foreign office or something, intern type of person, you may be asked to do those kind of things. So maybe he was a oversensitive hypersensitive guy who took everything down to racism and class and skin color and all that. So part of it might be in his imagination, not real. So uh, we have to give, I mean, I don't think the Christia freelance foreign office was that bad as he has tried to portray it. Any comments on that? We have people interested in getting a copy of the book. I'm telling you, you're inspiring them. <laughs> okay, yeah. This is how the book looks like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, and again, as I said, that these chapters, I feel that it is more of his imagination and his hypersensitive nature that caused him to resign from this very nice job uh, than anything real. And as far as not taking his uh, advice in different cultures, uh, that is quite uh, obvious that these people thought they were senior and he was junior. And after all, he was born up, born in Canada, probably had a Canadian accent. So they did not think that he would know that much about Afghanistan or Middle East compared to somebody like me who has lived there in their young years. Uh, who have probably will have more insight into those cultures. So, And we have a comment. I agree with your comments. He may be realizing that he needs to address his mental health issues. Yes, definitely. So it's partly depression and partly maybe he's hypersensitive uh, as a person. So he never admitted that, uh, you know, he has, it has anything to do with mental health issue, but I think probably he has realized it without mentioning it, that some of it is not his real, some of it is imagination, this discrimination and all these kind of things. One of your friends is on and he said, I think Canada was blindly following U.S. foreign policy. Yes, Canada sometimes have no choice, right? Canada is uh, uh, has the same population as the number of illegal immigrants in USA. So it's a tiny country compared to USA, not in size, but in economy. So Canada sometimes has to just follow USA because uh, it is so much dependent on USA. One of the reasons that Canada doesn't have a proper military is because they know that USA will protect it. So it even doesn't have a proper military. So sometimes Canada has no choice but to follow USA. And again, all these topics, Afghanistan, 
now palestine gaza they have two parts two sides of it most people are only aware of one side they are not aware of the other side so when somebody like me comes and tries to show them that there are problems in both sides people get very defensive and also that i can see some in him also that sometimes he gets very defensive about certain things without realizing that there might be problems on both sides and that is quite common i mean i am a little older now probably i have read a few more books been to a few more countries so i can see both sides better than most people who have just come out of a culture and you know they are trying to and he is still quite young so he will learn next slide so after this big thing that he had to leave his dream job and go for uh, treatment in depression for 2 years instead of running from his roots he tries to go back and find out what his roots really are before he has gone to a visit i think in pakistan but that was not uh, for a long time and also he had his step brother come in and live with him for some time but again those were not enough deep enough for him to really understand his culture so he goes to the hill station in mari though i have never been to mari i have friends who has been there i have been to karachi and i have been to places in india that is very similar to mari so i know what kind of place uh, it is it is a very nice place and the fact that his relatives live there gives me further reason to think that he is partly pashtun because a lot of pashtuns live in mari and also he mentioned in some comments that his mother used to be very beautiful with green eyes or blue eyes and fair skin and some kind of hair and all those those are mainly characteristics of people who are living in the hill stations of pakistan and many of them are pashtun so so mari also gives me more idea and as i said that uh, he might be a mixture of pashtuns and punjabis and the place that is his hometown is a very nice place so he has nothing to complain there he has met his old and new generation uh, of his relatives he delves into his family history and finally finds some measure of peace so when he delves into his family history he sees that some of his relatives were in good position under the british they had a lot of land so i think all this inferiority complex that his father is a nobody and his mother is not educated that is started becoming less and less once he saw that his previous generation was not that bad doing pretty well so that helped him to recover from his depression and uh, recover from his inferiority complex for uh, his skin color a little uh, so that helped him uh, both medically and probably that will help him f- future in life any question comment there's a comment that your analysis on omer is is very good it's he's young and this is probably you know part of the reason that he was feeling the way he was yes and he has not really although he read a lot he has not seen a lot of world practically it is one thing to read philosophers and all that another thing to see the world practically how the world works how much philosophy can you really apply in life for example he thought france was egalitarian france is nothing like egalitarian <laughs> france <laughs> france has a lot of ghettos poor people beggars and all sorts of things so his theoretical knowledge whenever it clashed with reality and he thought the liberal party probably they will give him a lot of value because he has a foreigner and all that they just treated him just like any other first year uh, first year professional <laughs> and again that threw him into depression so his expectations were all theoretical and when he missed the practical side of life he often overreacts and goes into depression and comes up with some kind of conclusion that are not always true and as i said being brown skin is no problem brown skin is beautiful so why would you be so having it's a is a very nice skin color so there is no reason to feel complex about the skin color so so it's kind of funny but uh, i can understand you know he was just trying to uh, trying to internalize what maybe somebody has told him in school or something like that i wonder too since he didn't so he goes as as a young man 
to mm -hmm. Pakistan and he finds peace. Yes. But he's missing that the early years when he could have he could have allowed that to become part of who he was. Whereas in Canada, I believe his teachers were white teachers. I can't remember that part. Most of them were, yeah. I think he really, um, there was a misunderstanding of who he was and, and you know, the problems between his mother and father. He, his upbringing was a little chaotic, right? And so he, I, I wonder if that created this imposter, you know, that he talks about trying to be somebody he isn't because he's, it's been shown to him that it's better to be white instead of brown, right? Which right. If he would have grown up or at least entered Canada when he was college age, he may have come in with more self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, I, I think, I, I think that has to be. And I think he could not place all, all, what he saw in his father and his immediate family in Toronto. That is just one subculture of many different types of culture in Pakistan and India. There are many more sophisticated people. His father was not a very sophisticated man who could not understand him, who could not explain him, answer him the questions he had. And that is true for many parents. Most people are so busy in earning money and making a livelihood. When your teenager ask, starts asking you questions, you have no answer. You say, I don't know. It's just, that's, that's the, how, how it is. So very few people nowadays have the time or energy to research things. And his father was one of them. And then his father used to always try to put down his mother in many ways. And I think that's part of the complex his father himself had that he could not make it big in Canada. So he used to put the mother down, oh, in your village, do you have a toilet? That kind of thing, right? So <laughs> that kind of thing only comes because he himself used to suffer from complex that he did not make it big in Canada. Again, make it big in Canada means a white collar job, a maybe two garage house, a new car. That's what big, making big in Canada means. And so what he saw in his father and mother, he thought this is all Pakistan. That is not the case. Right? Pakistan has a lot of fancy, sophisticated people, places, which he probably realized later. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. The unfulfilled dreams of his father were a part of the problem. Problem, exactly. Yes. And what I recall was too that his father had to drop out of university to help pay for some yes. relatives at home, right? Yeah, relatives at home. So yes. there, there's such a burden put on the first generation that comes in. Yes, that is true. And also his father was not the bookish type. He never mentions his father ever reading any book or even discussing any book with him. So his father was one of those macho, macho type who wants to work hard, earn for his money, loves his children. But on the sensitive side of life or the intellectual side of life, he doesn't know anything or even doesn't know what he doesn't know. And even his other uncles and aunties, they are either taxi driver or those who came here, taxi driver and those kind of things. So poor fellow, he didn't really meet a lot of probably Pakistanis who could show him that there are many types of Pakistanis, just not your father. Nashad, is there anything more about the book that you wanted to share or any final messages that you have for our audience? My message would be whether you are a, um, uh, and this message is for, uh, I have been saying this message for a long time, that one of the problems of this modern IT uh, information based economy is that because this earns a lot of money for us, IT jobs, engineering jobs, uh, and it's very hard to be a doctor in USA, it's so expensive and all that. So we do go and go into this line to make money, get our immigration and all these kind of things. There is nothing wrong with it. But then we neglect the other side of life, which will come handy to us, maybe not in our job directly, but later, like philosophy, like history, like understanding of religion, society, culture, we have no clue about those things. We might be a very good computer programmer. We might be a very good engineer. But when it comes to these other things, we have no clue. And that affects our later life when we are bringing up our children, when we are interacting with our community, when we are making a decision on an issue like Gaza 
or Ukraine because our knowledge is so limited. We go to one television station we like, like Al Jazeera or CNN or Fox News or MSNBC, depending on which one you like, and make our uh, conclusion about that. And that is very dangerous because although we might be highly educated, we might be totally helpless when it comes to solving some issues of our children, our neighbors, or some world world issues that will eventually affect us like global warming or terrorism or anything else. So it is, in, it is a good idea to study not only our subject where we have a job and we need to earn money, but other subjects and be a well-rounded person. That's my message. So, so, so very much. I want to thank the audience. Um, and I also want to thank Barem Pereira, who helped me to find Nasha. Some of you at Metro might remember Varen, who uh, studied here originally from Sri Lanka. And um, he is on the call today. And I, I just really appreciate that. So audience, thank you. Um, Nasha, I, I can't thank you enough. This is your way to come back to Metropolitan Community College through a virtual format. It's been really a pleasure. You're allowing us to record this. I know there's more that we can get into if we go back and listen again. Um, and your experiences as an international teacher and ability to relate to many of the topics. And you further um, define these, the situation that's described in Brown Boy. It's Brown Boy. It has um, given me, and I'm sure it's given many in the audience, things to think about. So thank you, thank you. Um, to, I also like to always thank our college library staff. They annually give us assistance in setting up the book series and they attend to requests that come in to borrow the books for anybody who's out there and you don't win a copy. There are books in the library that you can borrow um, and there'll be more information coming to everybody in an email. I hope you saw the evaluation link in the chat, but if not, that will also come to you and we appreciate your feedback. I'd like to call your attention to the next programs that are coming. We have another book discussion and if you can tell, I believe this is a great time of the year to read. So it's time to go to the library or in another manner, get a copy of A Most Tolerant Little Town by Rachel Louise Martin. I'm super excited that faculty member Tulani Grundy Meadows, who is a human relations and political science instructor at Metro, is going to lead that discussion. We're scheduled for right after the holiday break. So that first week after the holiday break on January 4th, which is a Thursday from 10 to 11 central time, we will be involved in that discussion. Um, and it is a Zoom only opportunity. And then it is the 39th annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration on January 10th, that is hybrid. So you can attend in person if you'd like to be in person and sit around people and be at a table and get food and see everything up close. That's the way to go. There is a $20 charge for that to cover the meal that is delightfully created by Metro's Institute for the Culinary Arts. If you can't get to the session um, or prefer to watch by Zoom, it is free and there are links for that. All of um, those links can be found at mccneb.edu slash Dr. King. Our keynote speaker is Ruben Shelton, and um, we will I will send this information also out to you in an email. I do want to say to everybody that I hope to see you on January 4th for the final book discussion. It will be my very last moderated activity as I am retiring and my last day at Metro is January 5th. So let's break the record and have the biggest crowd ever on January 4th at 10 a.m. Everybody have a great evening. I really appreciate your being here. Thank you. And I would like to add that we enjoyed our time with Barbara when we were students in Metro Community College. And I have very fond memories of her and we hope that she will not completely retire. She will do something more things and be in touch with us. Thank you so, so very much. All right. 
Everybody, you have a good, good evening. It's been... Bye, everybody. Thank you. Nice day. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.